department? Definitely, Amanda. Um, well, to give you the short version, um, we had set a date for Monkey Joe's, which was our second midweek visit. Uh, Laura was supposed to meet me there, and like she did the first time, she ran very late. And I actually texted Laura, which was a very important uh, thing, issue as far as my trial, because the text messages that I sent that were in the outbox of Amanda's phone were not timestamped when we received the communication report. However, the timestamps are available in the actual device, and the state refuses to let anyone examine the device, meaning turn the phone on, okay. uh, which is withholding exculpatory evidence because these text messages show me actually discouraging Laura, saying that it's too late. Uh, I tell her in a, in a uh, text message, you'll see the boys in two days. It's no big deal. And then she responds back to me at 2.58. It is a big deal to me. It's not a big deal to you. Something along those lines, and, and and so this whole thing about a lure is just the meeting place was always at Monkey Joe's. You know, Laura chose to come to my house, which she has done several times, which the state's evidence held uh, several emails where Laura invited herself to my home over the last year, and actually invited me to her house on two occasions. Okay. Anyway, so uh, Laura comes over to the house. Um, to discuss an out-of-court settlement. Uh, she wants $50,000 to drop her suit. Uh, we negotiated, wrote uh, about three or four contracts, and ultimately the one that the police found was the last one. Uh, and we settled on $25,000. And uh, after that was done, Laura had asked to hold our baby. She had never seen our baby. Um, this is the first time coming to the house since our baby had been born. And at this time, I left the room to go wake up her youngest son, Gentle, so that he could leave with his mother. And um, Amanda was supposed to be scanning this document for Laura. And word was exchanged. Uh, and Laura jumped Amanda as she was walking away from the table with the contract. Now, I was not in the room, but Amanda tells me that she had made a threat to take her child away from her. And the next thing she knew, Laura had her by the hair and was dragging her back to her and reaching over her shoulder. Amanda said that she backed into her and every reflex, she elbowed her with her elbow as hard as she could. And she caught her in the neck. Laura let her go, and Amanda says that she ran into the nursery and slammed the door. And this is almost on her heels. I come running in the room because I heard Laura fall. Uh, when I come into the living room, my oldest son, Grant, who was on the couch during all this conversation, uh, is standing up now looking over the couch at his mother on the floor. Amanda has locked herself in the nursery, and she's screaming, uh, call the police, I want her arrested, why did you leave her alone with me, why did you leave the room, and, you know, I'm smacking Laura on the face trying to get her up off the floor. And I think that there's this misconception that there was blood everywhere in our home. There was no blood in our home. Uh, a bleach stain is just that. It's just a bleach stain. And the towels that were found to clean up the bleach, as the police report showed, they were not blood on any of them. Well, Grant, uh, what happened? You're trying to you're trying to wake her up. She's not coming to. I mean, was she already deceased, or did you? Was there was there more? About um, uh, this happened very very quickly. Um, I was smacking her face, and within a minute. Uh, well, I went to sit her up, and that's when her, she died. Um, for la uh, I'm not trying to be too descriptive about how I'm certain that she died, but uh, it might be a bit degrading, um, but I'm certain that she died at that point when I went to sit her up. And um, my son, Grant, was standing not two feet in front of me, and uh, it wasn't, I wasn't out of the room a minute. When I came back into the room, I wouldn't even say it was a minute before uh, Laura died right there in front of me and my son. So basically, and, uh, I mean, and, and obviously you know that she's probably going to tell a different story when she goes to trial, but your contention is that you left the room and that there was an altercation between Laura and Amanda and that Amanda elbowed Laura in just the right place, and that's what caused her death? I'm not saying that uh, Amanda's uh, defense as far as hitting her in the neck killed her. I don't know that. 
Uh, Laura fell. Uh, I don't know what happened to Laura. I read Dr. Radish's report um, that there was a head injury. It's possible that her spinal column could have been disarticulated, causing higher functioning to fail. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what killed Laura. Um, I believe what my wife said because I don't see how it's possible that anything else could have happened. I wasn't even going out of the room a minute, and uh, she had no reason to lie to me, just like she had no reason to lie to her sister. She told me and Karen the same thing. Um, Amanda was the source of our information, and uh, I, if, if you look at the police report um, of Karen Berry, page 6882, line 8, the detective says, and she's not saying anything really other than she hurt Laura and she hurt her bad. But she never said, I killed her or anything like that. And in line 12, Karen says, she said she did it. And she said that, dot, 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 I don't remember ever, dot, dot, dot. But it was very clear to the three parties involved in the disposal of Laura's body how Laura died. And Karen Berry made that very clear to the police. Over 15 times in her uh, interview, she stated that my sister hurt her and hurt this woman bad, and um, she was understanding that this meant that the woman was dead because Amanda then, hey, she and Amanda then walked her property looking for places to Oh, well, agree. I and, mean, why? Yeah. Um, let's go back to that day, and then we'll move on a little bit to to Amanda and what she's saying or not saying. <clears throat> Tell me why you didn't call 911. Panic, terror. Um, uh, this was this traumatized me. I I was stunned. It was surreal. My son initially, uh, little Grant was he's three, um, and he had just seen his mother die. And more than anything, right then and there, I just wanted to rescue him and erase that. And I did not want that to sit in. And I told Amanda to leave with the children, and I was going to call the police. And that was my attention to at that time. And once they left, I just, I started drinking. I lost my nerve and I kind of got paralyzed. And two hours later, they came back. And my inaction and indecision uh, was one bad decision that committed us to several bad decisions. Um, I don't, I don't really, I don't have a defense, Amanda. Uh, there's, there's a reason, but there's no excuse. Um, it was, it was. Were you trying, were you trying to protect to your wife at the time? I mean, were you afraid what would happen to her if you told the truth? I didn't feel that Amanda, uh, I mean, I'm asking you a question initially. Initially, I was more concerned about little Grant seeing his mother die. Uh, and I didn't want him involved in the police investigation initially. And all I saw was Child Protective Services coming in and taking all three of our children while there was an investigation. Uh, my wife and I had just had a baby. That's, I'm a father. You know, I'm a father, I'm a husband. And this is what the feelings that were going through my mind um, at the time. Then, yeah, after Amanda left, and here I am, a black man in an apartment with a dead white lady who's been suing me, her story did not seem strong enough to compel someone to believe that there wasn't foul play involved, to me. Uh, and, and being a black man for 34 years, I have a certain amount of paranoia and distrust towards police. Um, and yeah, so at one point that did come into play that maybe they're going to take my wife away. and. Well, two Not things, exactly. yeah, I mean, two things come to mind about that. One would be, why didn't you testify at trial and tell your story? And then uh, the other would be, point. why hasn't she told the truth? Because she just watched you be convicted of first-degree murder. Well, I'll tell you, I'll answer your first question. I took the advice and counsel of my lawyer. Uh, who I put my life in his hands, and I believe I was misled, and I believe that uh, Jeff Cutler didn't have my best interest in mind. Uh, I wanted to take the stand, and uh, 
he told me that, hey, you know, they haven't proven their case. There's no reason for you to do that. And he advised me against this. Uh, taking the stand is not like on TV with law and order where you just get up there and tell your story. You have to trust this person to guide you through a direct and um, protect you during a cross-examination. And if this is the person that's going to do that, telling you not to do it, uh, I was I took the advice of my lawyer and it was a mistake. Okay. Well, why do you think Amanda hasn't told the truth? Well, Amanda has told the truth. She just hasn't told it to the right people. Um, Amanda accused herself of killing Laura to me and to her sister. Uh, I don't I don't know how to put it any more plainly than if you look at the facts of this case, uh, her body being found where it was found, uh, her involving her sister, this was Amanda's show. I love my wife. I took a vow to protect my wife, as Karen told the police, and, and I got involved to dispose of this body with Karen because of the same reasons Karen did. I loved Amanda. Um, why hasn't Amanda acknowledged what she's done? They took me to trial first. I mean, she sit and watched. Uh, she sit in Wake County Jail, and for two years, the fact that her sister incriminated her never hit the news. Now that weighed heavily on her defense attorney, and it said to them, "The state is covering this up. They have kept a tight lid on that information. They're doing that for a reason. And these people are playing a game of strategy here. It's not a defense attorney's job to." Uh, prove the truth of a matter. It's a defense attorney's job to protect their client against right. the, the state's case. And in I terms think of it's a clear message that we're not interested in prosecuting Amanda for this. We want grant aid for this. Right. I, I, and I hear what you're saying. Just finding out, you know, I, I know that you said there was alcohol involved. How you were able to do what you did afterwards um, to cover up her death, because obviously when you look at it, 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 it it's, it's a lot of things that most people would find really difficult to do. Um, so tell me about that and your thought process there. Well, Amanda, I am most people, and it was really difficult to do. Um, this was not something I derived any pleasure from or looked forward to doing. And uh, I had to think about my family and keeping them intact and the children I have and the wife I have and the life that I had at that time. And the impossible situation that Laura's uh, actions put me in. I didn't ask for this, and I wasn't prepared to deal with it. And I was terrorized, uh, terrified. I felt forced um, by fear. This put me in a state of mind I've never been in. Um, I'm a family man. I, as, as you heard Lauren Harris testify, every day I'm at Monkey Joe's with my boys. Every day I'm a full-time father. I don't get up and go to work eight or nine hours a day. Uh, I wake up and go to Blue Jay Creek Park down Creedmoor Road, and then we go to Crabtree Mall, then we go to Lynn Road Park uh, School, and, and then we go home for nap, and then we wake up and go to Monkey Joe's, and then we go to Target on Lynn Road, and I go home and cook dinner every night. This is my life. But, I, I mean, Grant, you could, I mean, guitar. again, as a regular guy, then you could see how the details of the aftermath of Laura's death would be so heinous to most people. And that in itself obviously doesn't make somebody guilty of causing her death, but I mean, you have to admit that, that it had probably influenced people's opinions. Um, oh yeah, I'm not denying that. I, I have, you have no resistance uh, from me there, yes. It's, uh, it's awful, it's deplorable, it's haunting. Uh, there's, there's no defense for it, and I, I don't want you to, to give you the impression that I'm trying to defend what we did. What we did was awful. Uh, I just want to make that clear. What would you do differently, Grant, in this situation? I mean, would you just have called 911 from the very beginning? I would have, because at, looking back on things, that would have gotten Amanda's story on record from her mouth. Before any manipulation, uh, before any games were played, uh, she would have told her story from her mouth, you know, not her sister pretending to be senile, not wanting to say the word killed because it's her baby sister, 
and and uh, coming to my trial and lying, uh, I would have definitely called 911. Uh, do I think we probably would have been charged with murder anyway, given the lies that Laura's friends were willing to tell on me? Probably. But I would have been in a better position to defend myself had Amanda gone on record immediately with what she had done. Do, what do you think is going to happen in her trial? I mean, do you think she's going to take the stand? Do you think she will tell the, this story, the, this, the truth? Well, her lawyer came and spoke to me Tuesday. Um, and he asked me to sign an affidavit saying that I would not take the stand if called, that I would plead the fifth. And I told him to plead the Fifth Amendment is to say I believe uh, the answers to the questions I would give would incriminate me. And I do not feel that the answers to the questions I would give would incriminate me. And I told him I wouldn't be pleading the Fifth if I was called to the stand. So, um, so do you think the state will call you, or do you not know? I have no idea. I'm up here in Pasco Tank. We don't get Raleigh news, and I don't really follow it. I don't, you know, uh, I'm, I know nothing about what's going on in Raleigh right now, okay. I, other than what Johnny Gaskin has come up here and shared with me that uh, he, he would like for me to plead the fifth. Um, I know that they've tried a, a couple of different scenarios, but I, I will tell you this. When Johnny and his assistant and my appeal lawyer were all sitting down, Johnny Gaskin acknowledged right off the bat. Now, Grant, you didn't see what happened. You weren't in the room, were you? Tell me where you were. And he gave me his pad and he asked me to draw him a map, show him where I was at. There is no doubt or question in anyone's mind that has looked at all the evidence, not what the judge has allowed, but what all the evidence, the state's case demonstrates that Grant Hayes did not contribute to Laura Ackerson's death. <coughs> um, uh, and tell me one more time, because I know we had it earlier, but I want to make sure I have it in something that's concise enough for television. You left the room, and something happened between Laura and Amanda. And when you came back, Laura was on the floor. Yes. And at that point, you didn't know what had happened, and she died very quickly after you got into the room. Right. And then you say that after talking to Amanda, your understanding is that there was a fight between the two of them, and Amanda says that she hit Laura in the neck with her elbow. Yes. Okay. I want to make sure that's right. One of the things, Grant, um, before we get cut off, uh, that I have to ask you about is... You know, a lot of people look at people's demeanor during a trial. And during your trial, um, you know, you did have moments where you seemed to be joking around with your lawyer and smiling. And then when they played the song, um, and I can't remember which song it was, but the song that was played towards the end that they contended was about Laura. You know, you listened to the song and kind of, you know, bopped along to it. And some people have said or thought that maybe that demeanor in the courtroom might have influenced the jury, that it, that it might have appeared cavalier? Well, let me address that. Okay. My trial, to me, was a joke. I did not get a fair trial, Amanda, and I'll tell you why uh, I didn't get a fair trial. Wake County Sheriff's Department opened my legal mail for two years. They opened my legal mail, they scanned it, they forwarded these scans to the district attorney's office, and I have an affidavit from my lawyer proving this because they turned over some of this mail to him uh, in July, uh, two months after my original trial date, where they opened legal mail that was clearly marked legal mail, they photographed the envelopes that have legal mail written up there on them and included that with the mail that they pulled out of those envelopes. So there is no mistake about it. The district attorney knew that he was receiving legal mail and reading it and storing it and kept it and used it. Now, they knew uh, they, they were defense 100%. This is an adversarial justice system here where they say, oh, well, we didn't, we had his legal mail, but we didn't read it. Okay, well, I say I didn't kill Laura Ackerson. Let me out of prison. 
you're not supposed to be breaching attorney-client privilege. And for you to blatantly do this for two years and casually turn over certain letters uh, right before my trial, they're stopped being two sides. I did not have a fair trial. My trial was compromised before I walked into the courtroom. And Amanda's has been, too, because I discussed her case and her defense because she was my co-defendant for two years. Right. Do you, I mean, do you feel like, in hindsight, though, that you should have been more solemn or that, you know, that you, you might have not come across the way that you wanted to in front of the jury? Because they don't have anything to base your personality on but what other people say when you don't take the stand. Well, Amanda, I'm, I'm not an actor. Um, I don't feel that I had a chance to win. I don't feel that I had a chance to win. My trial was rigged. I mean, the state sought to suppress their lead witness's testimony, the witness that told them how Laura died, who killed Laura, why she killed Laura, where Laura's body was at, what Grant Hayes' involvement was in all this, and even incriminated herself in assisting her sister in disposing of the body. The state is supposed to be pursuing truth. How do you try to suppress that witness's testimony and employ a snitch who's trying to work decades off of a prison sentence? Instead, uh, I'm, I'm, I look at life from my point of view. My trial did not begin when I walked into a courtroom wearing white. My trial began when they put handcuffs on me and started collecting evidence uh, against me to make me out to be a murderer. Where do you go and from the record here? Of my I mean, Grant, I'm what's your, I, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm afraid we're going to run out of time. What, what are you doing now legally to get out of prison? What, what's your next step? Well, hold on, Amanda. I'll, I'll be able to call you back. I have someone here who's going to be, let me call you back. But I, I didn't want to jump off of the, the, the issue of my okay. trial and my okay. demeanor at my trial. Go ahead. Um, uh, you were talking about it started when you were in handcuffs, not when you walked in the courtroom. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and the, 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 the nature of my trial was such as this. The, the DA sought to obscure the truth more than to uncover the truth, and they brought several witnesses into my trial who could not assist in any fact-finding at all. Witnesses who didn't know me and even stated they had never met me or had limited contact and knowledge about me to shade me with lies that Laura's own documentation contradicted. That means that the state elicited false testimony knowingly and to establish the, the, the element of premeditated murder, they use pure lies, unsubstantiated lies. Uh, for instance, Heidi Schumacher says that I threatened to kill Laura in 2009 and marked her April in a parking lot in North Raleigh. The facts are that Laura's own documentation places me out of the country that year. Laura's own documentation places herself out of the country during the time that Heidi says we were all in North Raleigh parking lot. And that's an important element of first-degree murder. A death threat shows intent. Secondly, Heidi Schumacher said that she came to our home off of Mitchell Mill Road and found a very pregnant Laura with a bloody nose and the beginning of a black eye. When the state's evidence shows that it was impossible for Heidi to have come to that home and found a very pregnant Laura with a bloody nose and a black eye, Laura states that we moved into that house near the end of April in 2008. And on her laptop are pictures of her from that time. Laura was only pregnant in that home for five days. We moved in on the, the weekend of the 27th, which was the day of our baby shower. And there's pictures of her then. And then there's pictures of her on May 1st in Wake Medical Hospital giving birth. And you can see her face clearly. It is impossible for Laura to have sustained a black eye at that home while being pregnant. These stories were made up, and these stories were very inflammatory and detrimental to my defense. And there was enough evidence in the discovery to impeach these witnesses had my attorney been interested in defending me. And the Constitution says a man is entitled to an enthusiastic defense, and when he doesn't get one, he doesn't have a fair trial. That the underhanded techniques that the state employs to convict me of murder are unprecedented. They have never done something like this before. Um, my lawyer, Jeff Cutler, said that in the 20 years he's been doing this, he's never received uh, legal mail and discovery with an apology. Oh, we didn't look at it, we didn't read it. Johnny Gaskins sitting told me in over 100 uh, capital murder cases he's defended, he's never had a person charged 
as the principal and the accessory at the same time. Yeah. They, it's, every underhanded technique in the book because they know, they know that had they taken the principal to trial first, they would not have been able to frame me for murder. Amanda was always the principal. The state's investigations indicated me. The state's investigations indicated me, and had they taken the principal to trial first, they would not have been able to frame me for murder. Well, and there's never, um, I mean, Grant, honestly, until I'd spoken with you today, I've never heard any version from the state, the police, the prosecutors about what happened in that apartment. So your, your story, your version, is the first time I'm ever hearing anything about what happened in that apartment because they've never, there's never been any public statement about that from that perspective, um, which is interesting to me that they had a whole trial and yet there was no information about the crime itself. All they could do was bring perjury in and lies to slander me into a murder conviction. That's all they could do because they wanted to hide the truth. Grant, where do you go? Where do you go from here? I mean, that's that was my question um, when I was sorry that I interrupted you earlier. But where, what's next for you? What are you doing to try to rectify this? Well, there's the appeals process, and um, the the errors in my trial are overwhelming. Um, the the rulings of Judge Stevens uh, not allowing the defense to compel truthful testimony from Karen Berry by refreshing her memory with her statement, her out of court statement. Uh, denied me the right to present it as a defense, and I'm certain that an appeals court would see that. Her statement changed drastically on the stand, and the purpose of an out-of-court statement is to hold a person to the facts, to truth. And and being that she gave a statement 11 days after Laura died and uh, five days after she helped dispose of Laura's body, she gave a statement to police that said Grant came here and slept for seven hours. Then she said Grant was outside a lot. Then she says, uh, the police ask her, when, 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 Laura, uh, when Amanda confides in you, Grant is obviously not around on page 6878. And she says, he's not. But when she gets on the stand, I'm automatically, uh, all of a sudden, I'm looming over them. I'm hovering. I never left them alone. Uh, I was intimidating. It's obvious that this woman had been tampered with. If not offered some sort of a deal, this lady sit and told the police that she assisted us told us where to buy acid. She let Amanda borrow her truck. She suggested putting the body in a septic tank. She let us use her son's boat. Uh, she so she, in other words, she was very much involved in the disposal of Laura's body. Karen was. was. As much of an accessory as okay. I was. We both helped Amanda dispose of Laura's body. And was, and, and like you said earlier, this was Amanda's show. I mean, was everything her idea from the dismemberment to the carrying her body to Texas to all of the different things? I mean, or were some of those your ideas? Well, we were not divided at that time. That's my wife. I love her. We had just had a baby and named her Lillian Love Hayes because she was our love child. We loved each other very much, and our family was traumatized. So I'm not trying to give the impression that I'm pushing blame and responsibility off on Amanda. I was just as much as invested in protecting my family as she was. Now, uh, my loyalty and my love for her, as Karen Berry stated to police, Grant said he loved his wife, he's going to protect her, he took vows. This is what I'm coming from here. Now, as far as dismembering her body, um, practically it was impossible for me to remove her from my third floor apartment by myself, intact. I mean, um, so when the, when the idea came up, it was the only way get her out of our house. Um, but taking her to her sisters and dumping her in a swamp, I'd never been to those people's house. I never met those people before. Uh, I don't know anything about a swamp or alligators. And Karen tells you in the statement that when her and Amanda went in the backyard walking the property looking for places to dump the body, Amanda kept coming back to the creek. She wanted to throw it in the creek, wanted to throw it in the creek. And that's ultimately what ended up happening. And that's the plan that Amanda outlaid to me in Raleigh, that she was going to take this body to Texas and put it in the swamp cross street from her sister's house. And that's what happened. Um, Do you think, is your position better or worse if Amanda gets convicted? That, uh, there's not going to be a winner in this situation, Amanda. I'm uh, speaking from the heart here. Amanda is the mother of, of my, my baby. 
And although she's not my wife anymore, that's Lily's mom. And just like I wouldn't wish ill will on Grant and General's mother, Laura, I wouldn't wish ill will on my wife. I'm not that type of a person. I might have been portrayed to be, but I'm not a vindictive person. Uh, I believe in karma. And I'll tell you this, my wife is not guilty of murder in any sense of the word. There was no, what she did was a reflex. And the injuries that Laura sustained as a result of her defending herself and her child led to her death. Laura got herself killed. I don't blame Amanda. Amanda had a responsibility and a duty to me to protect my child. Um, so you guys are not, uh, Grant, you, are you two divorced now? No, we're not divorced. We haven't, uh, you know, cohabitated for over a year. <laughs> uh, right, but I mean, you're still legally married. You're just obviously not physically together. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, who is your, uh, who, me, do you, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Put that up. I do not want my wife to get convicted of first degree murder. I do not want her to be convicted of any statute of murder. There was not a murder that took place, and justice would not be served if she were to be convicted of murder. Um, but the problem now that you have is that these corrupt prosecutors are not aimed in the direction of any truth, and so it's impossible to uncover truth as a result of this criminal trial. They covered the truth up to frame me, and the whole basis for her prosecution is fiction now, and you cannot approach it realistically without addressing the fiction of what what. What did our investigation uncover? Our investigation uncovered that Amanda confessed to killing this woman by accident to a family member, a family member she had no reason to lie to. And this woman gave us such truthful testimony and statement that we didn't even charge her with a crime, and we found a body. So you have to start there. I'm, and so go ahead and ask a question. Um, I'm trying to remember where I was. Who was who your appeals attorney? Do you have uh, somebody assigned as an appeals attorney? I do. Uh, Mr. Glenn Girding. Glenn Girding. How do you spell his last name? G-E-R-D-I-N-G. -E mm -hmm. Okay. And is he, is he with the, uh, the, the indigent defense? Who is he with? Cap yes. He was appointed by the state. Appointed by the state. Okay. Um, and so obviously that's your next step is, is hoping that, the, uh, that your appeal will be heard and that they will overturn your conviction or at least grant you a new trial. That's a guarantee, Amanda. Um, that's a guarantee. This, 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 this case, uh, this uh, trial was a sham. Listen to Detective Latour's statement. Okay. From page 6895, and he's summarizing what Karen has just told him. Amanda flat out told her that she hurt Laura, hurt her bad. Grant and them were talking at the swing, and Grant came over there. Grant starts adding to the conversation, saying, Amanda is his wife. I'm going to protect her. Uh, and then at some point, they kind of implied they brought her out there. This man clearly understood what had happened. And, you know, I hear what you're saying about them not allowing you to come. This is, this is, they, they covered up, they covered up the truth. They, they, they willfully convicted an innocent man of a, a crime that he didn't commit. And they went out of their way to cover up the truth. And now they're uh, maliciously prosecuting my wife. You know, right. When you, when, when you see what I have here in my lap, prosecutors are not supposed to bring perjury out of people. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to uncover the truth. There are several emails, Amanda, where Laura invites herself to my house. I'll be happy to pick the boys up from your home. I'll be happy to come to save you a trip to Wilson. I'll be happy to come pick them up from your apartment. Several times. They presented a, a, a picture of, of this woman being terrorized with me, of me being some kind of sociopath maniac who was threatening and beating her. They didn't produce one threat. They have over a thousand emails between us and, and from 2008 to 2011. Uh, this supposed secret email account, did they produce one email out of it? No. This woman told a bold-faced father that Grant was sending her threatening emails. Laura even says in her own parenting history report, Mr. Calloway asked a question. What, what, what level of hostility has been thus far in your relationship? And there is a place for life-threatening. Laura does not check life-threatening. Then it says that hostility is also included. She leaves unchecked threats of physical violence and actual personal physical violence. Those are the exact opposite of what her friend testified to. Right. I was that these women are more authoritative of what Laura experienced in our relationship than she is. Right. Why is it that the state sought to bring out this perjury from them when Laura herself 
never even said that I did these things. Look, we were in a custody battle that has been termed as acrimonious. If I had beat her up while she was pregnant, isn't that the type of thing you bring up in a custody battle? Right, and that Mark was never, never made a claim. Yeah. She never made that claim. Right. And, and all of her meticulous documentation that, that you heard several FBI mm -hmm. agents and her friends and her lawyers say, um, Detective Whitaker even said she documented all of her interaction with Grant Hayes down to the second. They found over 100 hours of covertly recorded audio from phone calls and personal interactions between Laura and I. 100 hours, over 1,000 emails. You never see Laura confronting me about ever being violent, ever threatening her, or you never see me threatening her. This right. is not our relationship. 